In this module, we'll cover the topic of evaluating your part design. This particular module will cover a lot of information. The goal of this will be to really review the part design guidelines, learn more about the different analyses, the sequences that are available, as well as learn about all the visualization tools available inside the program. Why? Part quality can be evaluated using many different methods and many different stages of the design. And the cost of making the part should always be taken into account. So we'll cover some tools you can use for this. Typically when you're evaluating your part design, you're going to start off in part only mode. This is going to be an iterative process typically to start with. So we're not going to invest a lot of time at this moment in modeling a feed system or cooling lines. At this point, this will be good enough. Now, if you're ready to run a fill analysis, there are a few key steps that we need to accomplish. One is to orient the model with the sprue in the positive z-direction. We've discussed this quite a bit in previous modules and why this is important. You want to select the inje injection locations which hopefully the gate location analysis helped you determine. Then you'll want to go into your analysis wizard, select fill as the analysis sequence, select the material, and then select the processing conditions. Hopefully these processing conditions were derived or you had some help with the molding window in finding these. Then you'll click analyze to launch the analysis. So some of the benefits of evaluating your part design up front is that it allows you to select the best gate locations. It ensures part can be manufactured. It also identifies any quality issues such as air traps, weld lines, or sink marks that you may need to be aware of. It allows you to compare materials and you can test the effect of your design changes on part quality. Maybe a decrease in part thickness to reduce your cycle time without actually compromising your part quality and cost. And you can get a cycle time estimate as well. Step one is to orient the model. The parts should be in tool position. You may ask what is tool position? That's where a sprue is in the positive z direction and your intended parting plane should be on the xy plane. This is required for accurate clamp force predictions. So if your part's not oriented, correctly, then your clamp force predictions will be off in your analysis. It's also good for, to have this set up for later on when you go to model your feed system. It'll make your life a lot easier. It's very easy to orient your model. It's right in the home panel. You go to geometry. And you see in the layout menu there's an option to rotate. You just select your part and rotate. Step two is to set your injection location. So from here, it's right in the home tab in your ribbon. There's an option or an icon for injection locations. Once you click that, you just select the location on your part in which you'd like to place that injection location. At this point, maybe you're just playing around with some ideas that you have, or you have some prior experience on what might be a good location for your injection location. If not, you always have the gate location analysis to help you out with a good starting point. So, if you specify an injection cone and you wish to move it after the fact, you can click on it and drag it. You can also double click it or right click on it to access the context menu and go into the properties. What this will do is allow you to modify the exact coordinates of that injection location. If you have an extra injection location or maybe it's nowhere near where you wanted it, you can always delete it. That's very easy. You either select it and hit delete, or you select it and you can right click and access delete within your context menu. Next, you'll select your analysis sequence. You do this within the analysis wizard, which is also where you'll put your process settings as well. So in this case, we'll select fill as our analysis sequence. If you happen to see that what you want to select is grayed out, you can always click on that and under that analysis information window, it will tell you what you're missing. So in this case, if we didn't have our injection cone, one of the requirements to run a fill analysis, it might tell us you need to create an uh, injection cone. 
If you're trying to run a cooling analysis, it could also tell you, hey, you need cooling lines before you can run this, or maybe you don't have the appropriate license. It'll tell you that as well. So within the Autodesk Simulation Moleflow Advisor tool, we are actually meshing the part prior to running an analysis. This is hands-off for the most part for the user. However, if you go in your analysis wizard, there is an accuracy tab, and you can see the slider bar that allows you to adjust the density or mesh. So this can be very useful to adjust if you have models with a large number of fillets, small radii, significant small features, or models where hotspots may occur. So keep in mind, as we covered in our FEA overview module, these fillets and radii are not necessary in a flow analysis in most cases. So just be cautious of this because this will increase your analysis time as you increase the levels in your accuracy. Another setting that you may notice in the accuracy tab is the gate contact diameter. Now this setting is really only relevant for the 3D analyses. There are two options for this. The first is automatic. We'll specify a two millimeter contact diameter when you're using this setting. But if you're running a pretty small part, we will automatically adjust this. There's also a diameter option. So with diameter, you just specify your own contact diameter. Just keep in mind, this is great for a preliminary analysis where we're doing some iterative cycles to really determine what we want to do. However, this setting is not meant to replace modeling a feed system. Here's a good example of where you may use that setting or that slider bar that we described previously to increase the resolution within our analysis. So, two ways it can help here in this example is you can see we can better evaluate the severity of our weld lines. The mouse cover on the left was run in the regular resolution, whereas the one on the right was run at a slightly higher resolution. You can see it also provides more detail in the temperature difference across the actual part surface. The one caution that I will give you is that as you increase your accuracy, you will be increasing your processing time on the model. Another thing we can do within the analysis wizard is select our actual material. You can see you can first select by manufacturer and then select the actual grade that you wish to use for your analysis. There's also a search option if you wish. Once you use the software for a little bit, it will actually store some commonly used materials towards the top of this menu. Like with many of the tools in the software, you can access them from more than one location. In this case, it's no different. So we can select our materials, you can see, from the ribbon, which still opens the analysis wizard, like we saw in the previous slide. No difference in the tools or functionality here. This slide just goes a little more in detail with what the search feature looks like. So once you click that search option, you can see you're presented with a search criteria box. From there, you can search by manufacturer, trade name, family abbreviation. You have many options here, and they're not just restricted to this list. If you think there's another option you might want to search by, there's an add button at the bottom there as well. Once you enter your fields you'd like to search on, it'll give you this top window, which essentially lists everything that meets your criteria. Within the software, you can also see there are several indicators for environmental impact, depending on the resin you pick. One of these features is the resin identification code. This is an industry standard and is available for all the thermoplastic material grades within our database. Look on the bottom of your pot bottle right now. You'll probably see one now, indicating the recyclability of that material. Another icon that you may see in the user interface in regards to environmental impact is the energy usage indicator. This is based off of the injection pressure and cooling time of that material and leverages the Autodesk Moldflow solver technology to help determine this. 
It's available for all the thermoplastic material grades within the database. Now the environmental impact indicators can be seen in two locations. One is in your study task panel. The other is in the actual analysis wizard on that material page. Once you select the material you're going to use, it will reflect the indicator or the environmental impact of that specific material. So let's say there are a few options for a material you'd like to use. You're not quite sure which one. So you can always use the compare option within the material search to help you narrow down your selection. To do this, after you search for your material, you just simply highlight multiple materials that you wish to evaluate and hit the compare button. Once you do that, you'll see a menu much like the one on the right where it does a side-by-side -side comparison of all those materials. The really neat feature about this is it's not just tabular data. You can come in here and click on these little graph icons and it will actually overlay their plots such as rheology data, thermal conductivity data, specific heat data, even PVT data. Very neat tool. Now the final tab that we'll want to set up in our analysis wizard is the process settings. In here you can see you specify a mold and melt temperature. The default values in there are dictated by the material you select and the material properties that come with it. However, you can change this if you wish. Some other settings you'll have access to will be the maximum injection pressure limit. The default is 180 megapascals, but you can always change this if you wish. There's also an option to adjust your VP switchover position by volume. This is simply the position in which you're switching from a velocity control to a pressure control. So maybe from your filling phase into your packing phase. There's also an option where you can specify or check to use an automatic injection time. And that's where you'll let the software determine what might be best for you. Or you can uncheck that and enter your own time. There's also a machine clamp open time. This is really to help determine the cycle time that you'll receive at the end of the analysis. Your model should be oriented properly prior to running an analysis. What is considered the proper part orientation? When should you consider using a higher processing resolution in your analysis? This is that little slider bar we spoke about. In this section, we'll cover some of the results interpretation for the fill analysis. The first thing we'll take a look at typically is the summary panel along the bottom of your UI. This will usually pop up after the analysis completes. It offers some great quick feedback on your analysis. Things such as the release, the material that you selected, and any processing inputs that you use for the analysis. It's also a great place to see if you have any model warnings. I always recommend coming in here to see if there are any type of warnings. Or, in the event that your analysis even failed, there could be an error in here indicating what may have happened and what you may need to correct. Now we'll take a look at the fill tab in the summary panel. In this fill tab, you'll see that there's a traffic light indicator. This is very useful for just a quick analysis on maybe how you're doing with your part. It's related to confidence of fill, so how confident we are that we're able to fill that part, as well as the overall quality prediction for that part. If it's red or yellow, you need to determine why. I typically start with the confidence of fill. In the fill tab of the summary panel, you also may notice that there's a table or several fields of information in there. If at any time you had any questions about what these were or what they're trying to tell you, you can always click on them and it'll take you to the appropriate help topic. You also notice at the very bottom, we're giving you an estimated cycle time. This is really going to give you an indication of how efficiently the part can be manufactured also allow you to make some possible design decisions such as maybe we need to reduce the part thickness and this can significantly reduce our time which of course cuts down manufacturing costs. Now we'll take a closer look at the confidence of fill plot. This is really showing you the probability that that part will be easy to produce or not. 
It's derived from our pressure and temperature calculations. And we really recommend that you investigate any red or yellow areas further using some of the other plots that we'll cover. Now we'll take a closer look at how the confidence of fill plot is derived. As we had discussed in the previous slide, it's looking at pressure and temperature. So let's take a closer look at the pressure side of things for now. So you can see there's a maximum injection pressure that we did set in our analysis wizard. The default was 180 megapascal, remember? So hopefully, if you needed to, you set this to something that was a little more practical to the machine you plan to run on. Because this will tell you if anything that's below 80% of that injection pressure limit is good, you'll get green. Anything between 80 and 100, you're getting close to your limitation, but it's still possible. Anything over 100%, naturally you're exceeding your machine's capacity and capabilities. So this part will likely not fill. On the other side, we're looking at temperature in relation to your melt temp and the transition temperature of that specific material. If you're between 100 and 80 percent of the melt temp, then that's good. It'll likely fill very easily. If you're between 60 and 80, it's going to be a little more difficult. As you get below 60, it's going to be very hard to fill that part. Not very much confidence that we'll be able to fill that. And naturally, anything below your transition temperature, that material is transitioned from a molten state to a solid state. So, it's not going to be able to move or be injected any further, and therefore will produce a short shot. Another plot that you'll receive after running a fill analysis will be the quality prediction plot. This is doing just as it states. It's estimating the expected quality of the part's appearance and its mechanical properties. So we're taking a look at several indicators to help us derive this. Temperature at flow fronts, one of them. Time to reach ejection temperature. The pressure drop. The fill time. Shear stresses. And shear rates are all considered in this plot. The one important thing to note is that this plot will actually not be generated if your part shorts. So if you do not see this, then make sure your part actually filled. So, when using any of what we would call stop of the stoplight plots, such as the confidence of fill or the quality prediction, you'll see that there's a results advisor tool here that can be very helpful in indicating what the exact issue is. So, this is available for the confidence of fill, the quality prediction, cooling quality, as well as the warpage indicator. And what you're going to do is you have to essentially make sure that the advisor tool is turned on and then you use your query tool to pick any location on that part. What this will do is display all the settings out there. So in this case, we're looking at the quality prediction. It tells us what the temperature of flow front is at that location, as well as the pressure drop, fill time, time to reach ejection temperature, shear stress, and shear rate. All things that we previously mentioned were part of the quality prediction plot. The other thing it'll do is show you the actual stoplight pattern and give you additional information down below. So in this case, it says the cooling time is high. There might be packing problems. If you still have questions, there's a link there to go access our online help for additional information. Another plot you'll have access to after running a fill analysis will be called plastic flow. This is simply showing you how the plastic th flows through the part geometry and you can animate this within the toolbar. You also receive a fill time plot. This shows the path the plastic takes through the part and how long it takes to get there. All the areas of the part that are filled at the same time are given the same color contour. So this tool can be very useful in not only animating and seeing how your part fills, but also seeing how the outer extremities fill. Are they filling at the same time? Do we have a balanced flow? Yes or no? You'll actually see here in the scaling that any areas in blue will fill first, whereas the red areas will fill last. You'll also receive an injection pressure plot. 
And this plot shows the maximum injection pressure that's seen prior to the VP switchover. Now keep in mind, the maximum pressure should be below 80% of the machine capacity to roughly to make sure you can produce this part. Any areas with higher injection pressures may have issues with overpacking. Anything with low injection pressures could also have underpacking. So keep that in mind as well as you're reviewing this part. So now the pressure drop plot. This plot is basically telling you what pressure is required to fill an area of the part from the injection location at the time that area is actually filled. So the gate location is going to show a zero pressure. You may ask, what are some ways I can use this plot? Well, there's some good ways to. You can use this in combination with the temperature at flow front plot to help determine the strength of your weld lines. As we had mentioned in our mole flow design principles section of this training, the strength of a weld line is really dependent on the temperature and the pressure they meet at. If your, the flow fronts are meeting at a high temperature as well as a high pressure, we know that will be a strong weld line. However, if they meet at a low temperature and a low pressure, then that means that weld line is going to probably be pretty weak and something that we'll want to consider. High pressure drops can also lead to packing problems because of the lack of uniformity within the part. So keep that in mind as well as you're reviewing this result. The temperature of flow front plot, as we mentioned in the previous slide, can be very useful. This is basically displaying the temperature of the advancing flow front. So as the flow front reaches that location, we take a snapshot of the temperature we see. The range between our min and max values on this scale should typically be between 20 degrees Celsius because we don't want to see a huge temperature drop in our flow front as we fill our part. Narrow distribution contributes to a uniform packing, and this in turn will help reduce your warpage or your deflection. Low temperatures may indicate areas that could be difficult to pack or even fill. High temperatures may give you an indication that you could have some surface blemishes in those areas. So this can be a very useful plot for many different things. You also receive an orientation and skin plot. This is really indicating the molecular alignment on the surface of the part. So really what you're going for is a uniform orientation as it leads to better surface quality in most cases. You can also keep in mind if you're thinking about shrinkage that unfilled materials will shrink more in the direction of orientation whereas filled will shrink more transverse to the direction. The average temperature plot is also there. It shows the average temperature through the thickness of the part at the end of fill. What we're looking for here typically are either hot spots or cold spots. If we see hot spots we may want to investigate if there's any significant shear heating going on there as that may indicate an injection time might be too fast. If we're seeing cold spots we want to be aware of those areas because they may be filling early with a little flow after the parts filled that could lead to packing issues. It could also indicate that there's some hesitation going on if we have some thin rib sections in this part. The time to reach ejection temperature plot is going to show us the amount of time is required to reach the ejection temperature from the start of fill of course. This can be used to evaluate and set an initial cool time and get an indication of what your overall cycle time may be. This plot's going to be dependent mainly on the material as well as the part. So what in the part? The thickness or even the variation in thickness. Again, this is one of those plots, much like the quality plot, that will not be generated if you get a short shot. So if you do not see this, make sure that your part actually filled. A frozen layer fraction at end to fill. This has shown us the thickness of the frozen layer as a percentage at the end of the filling phase. So during the filling phase, the frozen layer should typically be uniform and low. When we say low, we mean mostly below 10 to 15 percent. If you're seeing a higher frozen layer fraction above 10 to 15 percent, 
it could be very difficult to pack this part out. A frozen layer of 50% as a general guideline could require up to eight times the pressure to pack out the part. That's something to be aware of. For the air trap plot, this will basically show you where the melt stops flowing and leaves behind a bubble, a bubble of air, so we call it an air trap. Air traps typically occur where two or more flow fronts meet. When you're looking at this result, you're mainly going to be concerned with where these air traps are forming. Hopefully on your parting lines, because they're normally very easy to vent. If they're on ribs or bosses, it could be slightly more difficult to vent. You may have to get creative in your solution there. But if it's on the main part body, this could be a significant problem and should be avoided if possible. So there's a weld line plot as well. Weld lines are formed when two flow fronts meet. The result can be used in combination with the fill time, pressure drop, as well as a temperature of flow front plots as we have mentioned before to investigate the strength of these weld lines. They should not exist in areas of high stress because these can cause weak parts, weak spots in your part. So if you have these in bosses or maybe even fastener holes, this could lead to part failure. When investigating weld lines and air traps further, you can use the results advisor. As you can see from these images, it allows you to display the details of the weld line angle, flow front temperature, pressure drop, injection pressure, as well as the fill time for a specific weld line or air trap. This allows you to see the exact conditions at which these defects are formed at and will allow you to make a more informed decision as if these are acceptable or not. The grow from plot, it'll indicate the areas filled by each specific gate on your part. So each gate will be represented by a different color. As you see in the image below, we have three gates or three injection cones on the part, so we have three different colors. An equal distribution in color suggests that we have a uniform filling as well as a balanced flow. If the distribution is color is not equal, then we can typically say the flow is unbalanced. When reviewing the temperature at flow front result, what is the recommended range between the minimum and maximum temperature values? When weld lines cannot be avoided, the temperature at flow front and pressure drop plots can give us a better understanding on the strength of the weld line, true or false. Now we'll take a closer look at the results interpretation for a cooling quality analysis. The cooling quality analysis will primarily help you identify heat concentrations on your model. It evaluates the impact of model thickness on cooling as well. So it can help you compare geometry effects such as sharp corner versus smooth corner, deep core versus shallow core, or even features within close proximity of one another. This is not a cooling analysis, but it can help you in designing your cooling layout. So where should I place my water lines? Do I need any special inserts? Maybe there's need for beryllium copper insert in a deep draw in my part. The cooling quality analysis will give you three main results. The temperature variance, cool time variance, as well as cooling quality. The cooling quality plot will display where heat tends to stay in a location due to its shape and thickness. Some of the assumptions that you should be made aware of when reviewing this plot is that the part is assumed to be in the center of a block of metal. There are no cooling circuits a fixed cycle time, and heat leaves the hot part by naturally flowing towards the extremities of the block. So is my cooling quality acceptable on my part? This plot is a traffic light plot where you get a green, yellow, or red readout on areas of the part. So if you have green, that means there's a fish amount of cooling there. Yellow, areas where cooling could improve and red are areas of poor cooling. So these red areas and yellow areas 
might be locations in the part where I need to focus additional cooling when I go to design my cooling system. This result is really a combination of the temperature variance and cooling time variance. So temperature variance is really going to be affected by shape, whereas the cooling time variance is mainly going to be affected by thickness. You can use the results advisor for the cooling quality result as well. And this will show you where you can query on areas and see what the temperature variance and cooling time variance is for that specific location. Now we'll take a look at the temperature variance plot. This highlights where the surface temperature is different from the average temperature. So blue is negative, which are areas that are colder than the average temperature of the part. Red is positive, areas that are hotter than the average. This plot is mainly influenced by part geometry as well as localized thicknesses. One thing you'll want to be aware of on this plot as well is the range on your scale. Typically, the smaller the absolute value on this range, the better. Under 5 degrees Celsius, or 9 degrees Fahrenheit, is optimum. That's most important for semi-crystalline or crystalline materials, naturally. But if you're working with amorphous materials, sometimes you can get away with keeping this range under 10 degrees Celsius, or 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Another cooling time variance. This shows the deviation in cooling time of any location on the part in relation to the average cooling time of the part. So red areas are positive and these areas typically or will take longer to freeze than the average time to freeze the part. Blue areas are negative and they are typically areas which freeze quicker than the part's average. This is really dominated by part thickness. The cooling quality analysis primarily identifies heat concentrations on the model and can help with designing your cooling system, true or false. Which of the following are assumptions that are made by the cooling quality analysis? The results advisor tool is a good way to investigate poor quality issues further on the stoplight plots, true or false. Now we'll cover the results interpretation for the sink mark analysis. So, before we get into sink mark analysis, we should first define what a sink mark is. Sink mark is basically a depression in the part surface that is typically undesirable. The sink mark analysis will help you identify the location of these as well as the depth. Some contributors to the sink mark and their formation would be localized geometric features, low packing pressure, or even a short pack time. The sink mark analysis will basically give you two results, a sink mark estimated plot as well as a sink mark shaded plot. The sink marks estimate plot will indicate the presence and location of sink marks. It will also give you a rough estimate on the depth of them. These will typically be formed at T-shaped intersections, so maybe at the base of a rib. The important thing to note that this does not indicate sink marks caused by locally thick regions. So, if you're interested in investigating those regions further, maybe you should run a full fill pack analysis and investigate the volumetric shrinkage plot to see what the shrinkage in those areas are. And that'll give you a better indication if you have problems along those lines. But, when you're looking at the sink mark estimate plot, typically use metric as the values are very small. The second plot is the sink mark shaded plot. Sink marks are depressions on the surface of the part. So this plot is basically have visualizing this for you. Sometimes they can be very small. So there is an option to adjust the scale factor so you can really isolate the areas that these sink marks could be forming in. In reality, sink marks, how noticeable they are, are typically affected by the color of the model as well as the surface texture. So we do have some additional tools or second package that you could use to export this to Showcase, which gives you a more photorealistic rendering of the part and the sink marks. From there, you could take it a step further and even add texture or change the color to see if you can hide that. If you can't quite hide the sink marks, then you may need to come back in here 
and rethink some of your processing conditions or your part design. Now we'll give you some design tips to help minimize your sink marks. If we take a look at this image at the top of the slide, on the left hand side you can see there are a few bad designs here. They have a couple localized thick regions that will likely result in sink marks. If we look at the right, here's some modifications that we could do to reduce the probability that sink marks forming in these areas. If you can't modify your part design or you're restricted in that area, you could always try to change your processing conditions to try to process those out. You could also move gates closer to the sink marks to help pack them out a little better. Sink mark plots will only show sink marks at T-shaped intersections when appropriate, and not areas caused by locally thick areas, true or false. Now we'll take a look at some of the visualization tools that you can use for your results interpretation. There's an option to choose between a smooth or a banded display. This tool is used to toggle between smooth and banded result contours. But it's only available for contour color range results, such as the fill time plot that we see here. It allows you to see exact bands or defined bands that share the same result values. It's also an accumulated option. This tool is used to toggle between the display of accumulated result contours or just the current contour. So what I commonly use this for is maybe finding the last places to fill. That could be in several locations of the part, so I'd animate through this to see where the last places exactly would be to fill within my part. This option is available only for continuous color range results. So we've discussed the examine tool previously. However, one important thing to point out is that you can use the control key to examine multiple result values at once. So all you do is with your examine tool active, you click on the part, hold the control key, click on another portion of the part, and a third and a fourth. And that will allow you to display multiple values as you're seeing in this image. This can be very useful. Nodal averaging option is also a good one to be aware of. When this is on, it basically takes the average value of the elements surrounding a central node. Without it turned on, each element has a value and its own corresponding color so each element is clearly visible. With nodal averaging turned off, the part may not be as visually appealing. However, it can help you find exact values a little more easily. Let's say you're trying to find your max shear rate or shear stress. You turn nodal averaging off and that will help you to find it because that max value could be happening at such a small area, it could be averaged out and you could have difficulties finding it with the nodal averaging turned on. It's also important to note that this is only available when you're running dual domain models. The result scaling tool is another useful one. I use it for two main reasons. One is to investigate specific areas within the part. Another would be to compare models. It's very common that you compare two models and if you're looking at different scales between the models, things may not always look quite right or may look worse than they really are. So to truly make an informed decision between multiple iterations on an analysis, you should be setting your scales to be similar. This is a very good example of how scaling can be important. If we take a look at the two images on the left, we have a camera body. And you can see, they look pretty much identical if we're just looking at the image. However, if we look at the scale, the top one has a pressure drop of 48 megapascals, whereas the bottom one is almost 74 megapascals. Quite a difference, but not as visually apparent. If we adjust that scale to be similar, so we adjust our scale from zero to just about 74 megapascals, you can see how much different that looks. This is why it's very important to be conscious of the scaling when reviewing your results between several iterations. There are also some model comparison tools available to you. This is very helpful when comparing two or more iterations or models. They allow you to lock views, lock animations, and lock results. When you lock them together, 
This will automatically synchronize any results that you turn on or off, as well as your model orientation. So as you rotate one model, it'll rotate the other locked models as well. Cutting planes are also a very commonly used feature. These are very useful to see small detail possibly inside the part. More than one cutting plane can actually be activated at one time, so we can cut our parts in several locations. New planes can also be created in addition to the default XY, YZ, and ZX planes. And when you create a new plane, it's basically going to use your screen as a cutting plane. So you'll want to orient your model with your screen and then press that button and it'll create that cutting plane for you. You also have an option to flip cutting planes and there's an option to move those cutting planes. Here's some general guidelines that you can keep in mind when trying to interpret your results. What we're looking for are trends instead of absolute values, especially in the beginning of the process. Have clear objectives when you start out, such as determine the minimum required gates you need, optimize your gate locations, optimize your part design, balance the runner system, and optimize the runner volume. And also, determine if the design is optimized by comparing results. You may use which key to examine multiple result values at once when using the query tool. Now we'll take a closer look at Cost Advisor. Cost Advisor is a built-in cost estimation tool. When using Cost Advisor, the part cost is broken on into four key components. Material cost, mold manufacturing cost, machine operating costs, as well as post molding costs. The total cost is a sum of these four individual costs. This will allow you to calculate a figure in which you can use as a base price and possibly your quotes. It allows you also to find the cost differences between similar materials or even machines of different sizes. To receive your cost advisor results, you'll basically go through a wizard that will ask you a few questions. The first few pages will be based on material cost and usage. As you can see on the image in the left, they're going to ask you how many shots are going to be produced for this, the material, as well as the cost for that material. As you progress to the next page, it's going to ask you some material usage questions, such as what's your estimated scrap rate? and if you're allowed to use regrind, what is the percentage of regrind? Next, we'll progress to the mold and molding costs. As you can see on the left, it's going to ask us some information about what we estimate the cost of the construction of our mold would be, how many shots we'd expect to get out of this mold, and if there are any additional maintenance costs that we need to consider. From there, it calculates really how many molds we would need and the maintenance on those. The screen on the right, you can see, this will calculate what the running costs are and the machine costs. So, how much does this machine cost you in electricity to run in an hour? And the final screen will ask you some questions in regards to post molding costs. Are there additional finishing costs? Assembly costs? Maybe some packing and shipping? or even additional overhead. That can all be factored here. Once you've completed or filled in all the data, you'll see it'll give us this nice tabular sheet for you. This will give us a total cost breakdown for each of the four components over the life of this project. It will also give you a total cost breakdown per shot for each one of the four components. If we scroll a little further, a little further down in this table, you can see there's a pie chart. This pie chart will show you how much each of these four components contributes to the overall part cost. So maybe my material costs are the majority of this overall part cost. Is there a cheaper material out there that I can use to help make my part a little more profitable? Maybe. These are all things you can evaluate a little closer with the cost advisor tool. And as always, with these tables, if you have any questions about any of the fields in them, you can always click on them 
and it will open our online help with additional details in regards to that topic. Cost Advisor is a built-in cost estimation tool for Moleflow Advisor, true or false. Which of the following components are used to determine the total part cost? The Cost Advisor tool will offer a cost estimation for the entire run and per shot, true or false. When reviewing your results in the Summary tab, you may click on the fields to view additional help topics on that subject, true or false. Cost Advisor can be used to find cost differences between similar materials or machines of different sizes, true or false. With the software open, let's browse to the existing part design study inside of our training files. In order to do this, simply use the Open Project button from inside the interface. Browse to the location where the project exists simply by going to the Autodesk Learning, Autodesk Moldflow, Part Design folder, and selecting the partdesign.mpa project file. When you select Open, you'll be able to see all of the existing studies that exist inside of this project. Notice the clamp study exists here as well. Simply double click the clamp study, the model will automatically open in the view screen to the right. You'll notice the analysis has already been completed on the model as the icons for the results have already been colored in. Please take a moment to evaluate the model before we start looking at results. By using the navigation bar on the right side of the screen, we can rotate the model to visualize the entire geometry. We can also use the selection option to pick specific geometry features or boundary conditions, like the gate location. Simply select the gate location, right click, and select properties to view the three dimensional coordinates for this analysis. We can also take a look at the analysis wizard. The analysis wizard option will show us the processing conditions used to run the analysis. Either use the next button or simply click on the process settings tab to see the analysis settings that were used. Notice the melt and mold temperatures as well as the injection time and switchover point specified. Remember to select cancel because using finish or analyze will delete your existing results. Also take a look at the summary window. You should notice a very similar setup existing inside the summary window showing the mold and melt temperatures as well as the automatic selections for injection speed and switchover point that were specified in the processing conditions. Remember to take a look at tabs like the filling and the sync mark to get a full view of the analytical outputs that are a result of the simulation. Also remember the cost advisor exists for us to get an estimate on the cost to manufacture this component. Once the summary options have been completely interrogated, close this down and click back on the Tasks tab in the Project pane. This again gives us the view of all of the setup, all of the existing studies, and all of the results available for the simulation that's already been run. For the purpose of this analysis, let's take a look at the weld lines. To visualize the weld lines, simply activate the weld line result by clicking the box next to the weld line output. For the purpose of the result, let's focus on the weld line on the top side of the model. In order to better view this, you can use the view cube or use the navigation system on the right side of the screen. We can also overlay existing results on top of any currently displayed result. For example, by taking a look at the weld line, we may also want to show the filling pattern. By selecting the fill pattern and right clicking on top of it, I can overlay the result on top of my existing weld line output. I can even go to my results tab and run the animation of the filling pattern to see the weld line forming. By using the step buttons, I can actually see the melt coming together to form the weld line at the top of the hoop. For a better view, let's take a look at the view tab. Notice that a previously defined view angle has already been described in the software. It's been named weld line. By selecting the weld line view, you'll notice that that previously saved view is now oriented and used to visualize the weld line. Right click over the fill time plot and select properties.
we're now going to change our view from a shaded plot to a contour plot. And we're also going to change our mesh display options from opaque to transparent. With these specified, select OK, and you'll now be able to see the contour view of the filling pattern along with the weld lines that exist on the model. From the fill time plot, we can also see that this weld line forms last. It's near the end of filling, and if the results are used, and the result is queried on, we can see the time in which these weld lines are forming. Now, let's deselect the fill time plot so only the weld lines are visible on the model. Let's right click over the injection pressure so that we can again overlay the result on top of our existing weld lines. Now, by using the advisor icon, we can activate the advisor based view. This gives us the ability now to select specific locations around the weld line to see what the pressure is at that location. By using the control button on your keyboard, you can select multiple locations. Please note that the pressure around this weld line is zero. This means that we potentially have a poor bond at the weld line and could cause a structural problem for us later. Let's continue to investigate this weld line and see what other issues we may run into. If we take a look now, we're going to turn off our injection pressure and again reactivate only the weld lines. With the weld lines active now, we can also take a look at the orientation at skin. By overlaying this result, we can see how well mixed the orientation or the molecules are of the material and see if we're going to have a good bond. For this particular part, the fact that we have a low pressure, this is near the end of fill, and our orientation goes perpendicular to the direction we'd like, we potentially have a weak spot or a structurally unsound location in our part. This weld line could be a problem for us if this particular geometry goes into a loading situation in its service environment. Remember to evaluate all aspects of the weld line when running a simulation. Weld lines are always structural concerns for an injection molded part. Now that you've watched this presentation and had an opportunity to view the demo video, please try out these exercises to better your skills. For additional details on how to access these exercises, please refer to the introduction video. Thank you.